Okay, thank you first off for being so kind as to stick around as this is the last talk of the day. It's actually, uh, I, I don't want to stand between you and closing remarks, so I'll try to keep this snappy. And also, something occurred to me. I'm, I'm a storyteller by nature, so a lot of this has changed uh, as time has gone on since even when it was submitted and accepted. And thank you to the folks at LastCon for allowing me this opportunity. As I mentioned, I'm a storyteller, and so I like to share things in the form of, of storytelling. So in that concept, we all want the future right, right? We, we want some kind of newfangled flying skateboard that allows us to make toast while we're drinking our coffee and giving blood at the same time while donating organs and still having time for breakfast, dinner, and some kind of social life. No, okay, we want the future, we want this, right? Not, not this, no, no, we want, we want the future in the format we can digest and use. Not, not this, no, 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 no. We, we want some kind of flying car or something until we actually get into the serious bits of what's really going on. So we actually have to fight with all of the social contracts that we have day to day. And whenever there are piles of money in play, we have to change the way we do things. A very basic example that is real world and real life to me was trying to do my timesheet, which for this company that I was recently a part of, and a different company as well, was still being done on paper and you actually had to, um, well, I'll explain here that you have to turn in your timesheet and I said, oh, okay, great, can I mail it in? By the way, I look much better over there, right? Uh, that might not be the most recent of pictures and I might have, you know, more hair there. But the uh, truth is I said, well, can I just email the timesheet to you? Well, no. Uh oh, okay, no, I, I can't do that. No, we don't, we don't support that. You can't turn that in, it's not acceptable. So that's no big deal, I'll just scan it and I'll send it that way. Was that all right? And they said, no, can't accept that either. Okay, so what exactly am I supposed to do to get this to you? Well, seriously, the way we accept it, uh, if not through electronic means, is you ready? You holding your breath? I can see you're all tense with anxiety. Facts. I said, wait, wait, what? Um, they said, no, facts? Well, yeah, yeah, facts. No, no. <laughs> Facts, yeah, facts, come on. What, uh, okay, look, it, it is 2015, 2016, why would we use this technology? And, and they really meant it. And so I actually used my laptop to take the spreadsheet, print it to a fax format from the software fax driver built into Windows desktop machines, and then emailed them that and they accepted it because it looked like a fax and that was considered acceptable, and I don't understand how on earth this can even be. The level of what is so high at this point, it might as well look like this. So if we think about it for a second, what is it we're actually trusting? I understand the concept. We all started out with pen, plain pen and ink, right? We stood there, we signed in front of someone else. That's what made sense. I was standing facing anybody, turning in my timesheet, but wait, there's no such thing as an original copy, or at least it's some kind of oxymoron or something. What we wind up with is, if you think back on it, back in 2000s, then President Clinton signed the Electronic Signatures and Global and National Commerce Act, saying that it was possible to use your electronic signature, which had no proper format at that time, to do stuff. It was trustworthy, is the point. So I don't have to stand in front of you but for some reason, even today, this wet ink is worth more than this digital signature of ours. Now, part of the problem is obviously because we've made it about as simple as a Rube Goldberg machine. Uh, but there are other ways that we can actually assert our identity, right? We can, we can like the body hackers. You heard of this, right? Folks are taking chips just like you can do for pets, but you can do this to yourself. So you can actually use that to identify yourself, and that in some cases can be acceptable, acceptable or from the old school physical format, we can just do some kind of wax seal, right? Proof that no one is tampered with it, because that's what digital signing really gives us. The ability to trust that it was actually signed. No one's tampered with it. It's still from the person we said it was from, because that's what the rule books say. But going back to body hacks for a second, it's a little interesting if you start to think about it, 
because, you know, it, it's hard enough to imagine tech support these days making a phone call and talking to someone saying I'm having trouble X, Y, Z. You know, because when you're thinking about body hacks and injecting chips and objects into our person, what kind of risks are there for spoofing? You start to wonder if, you know, if there's some kind of infection, you could wind up with a possessed hand that might break plates over your head. You don't know, you should shop smart. As smart. But if you're not going to be worried about the zombie apocalypse, you should really consider that our society relies heavily on the ability to produce and exchange legitimate and trustworthy documents. Nothing is authentic without authentication, right? We don't trust anything or shouldn't unless we have some reasonable assurance. And where are you going to get that assurance from, everybody? Because look, here's a perfect example. This is a story from CBS from earlier this year or maybe a little earlier, actually, maybe it's 2014. The point was is that it's the real thing versus an auto pen. You know what an auto pen is? Who here knows? Anybody? Hands, feet, ears, wiggle them if no. So an auto pen copies an existing wet ink signature and duplicates it nearly identically. So how many of you have bought memorabilia off of some kind of online auction site that was signed? I personally know a couple of folks who have taken pictures that they have, they duplicate the pictures and have used devices to do this. And they claim they sell them for cheap because, wow, that's a great price for that. I don't know, how'd you get the dog to sign that? Whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that we don't trust it. We trust signatures. They change as we age, right? I mean, it, it, here is Andy Warhol's signature from when he was younger, as he progressed in his life, or maybe, in truth, this is really one person's signature over the course of an entire day at a conference, depending on how many drink tickets have been handed out. I'm not gonna say. But forgery is nothing new, right? From some kind of credit card fraud to actual key loggers and methods that people take and then replay, just like Dave Kennedy was talking about a short while ago. There are easy ways to duplicate what people are doing and there are lots of really bad eggs out there that will put all kinds of bad software into play and they can take advantage of us and even down to ransomware where you have to pay someone money to get your stuff back. By the way, back up your stuff. Obviously, I'm right, pe preaching to the choir, shouting into the echo chamber, but it's worth mentioning. So, as any curious person would probably do, you run afoul at some point of wanting to know what other people are doing in a space you actively are in. I've actually changed jobs since I submitted this talk and actually uh, wrote the original version of it, which changed very recently. But looking out on the horizon, I looked across the waters because I couldn't solve an issue I was having with digital signature technology, specifically with PKI implementation. And I just got so frustrated. And so I realized that not everybody works the same way, because duh. I like to believe in my own mind that I had all the ideas, but day to day I'm shown over and over again, I just don't have that kind of level of knowledge. But everyone else, there are lots of good folks out there who are willing to share their information. And I stumbled across this thing in Europe, the Belgians have their own electronic national identity card. They actually have this system that they use, everybody is going to have a card. And then I stumbled into this other thing because I was trying to figure out how it was they actually did digital signatures and spread their ideas. And they use this thing called VOMS. And VOMS is this virtual organization membership service which basically issues derived credentials so that if you are part of a member organization, I can extend trust to you. I'm willing to let you use my expensive resources so that you can do the thing you are in love with doing. Whatever it was, whatever you were trying to accomplish, because you only have, I don't know, the uh, old Amiga computer from the 90s sitting on your desk at home, and you might not have the ability to do the things that our supercomputing lab has. So we're going to give you access, you'll get issued a special card, and then you can get another certificate. So it's still hardware backed, and they issue software certificates that let you do things for a time. Not so different than really a Kerberos or any other kind of authentication mechanism, but it's certificate based, which turns out to be the source of the origins of this talk. Why is something that is electronically provable better than my wet ink signature, or not rather, why is it not considered better than my wet ink signature? Okay, so I had to learn better search foo, which is why all those little search logos are over there. And it turned out that it was a reminder as I had to just keep digging and digging that 
you always have to be a lifelong learner and you have to be willing to take steps every single day to realize you just don't know enough. In fact, you know very little. And as a mistake earlier in my career life went, I simply didn't know that I didn't know enough. That was so frustrating to wake up every day and not realize what was outside. Because I spend enough time hanging out with a small group or worse yet, by yourself and you don't have an outlet and you can discover quite quickly that you don't have that thing you need, which is connectivity and an audience of people that you can work with to grow professionally, personally, psychologically. So that's where the, the Kung Fu comes in. You know, so I, in 2011, was invited and dragged to a thing that I didn't even think was real thanks to an internet glitch. Uh, and then I got invited to go and participate in something else with another friend, and that led to going to another thing, and that led here. And one of the most amazing things about going to conferences is actually finding people who are willing to share of themselves, to give of themselves, to share of their knowledge, and reach out and give all of us something more to work with. Whether it's tools, ideas, camaraderie, friendship, or heck, maybe even a drink ticket if that's your thing. Whatever it is, the fact of the matter is we need one another to grow and get better at everything that we love to do. And if we don't believe that, then I think we're all heading down a very bad path. But when we get down to it, thinking back on this, what do we trust and why, we have to admit, whether we mean to or not, or want to or not, policy is a very necessary part of this complete nutritious identity breakfast. The National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace is a silly mouthful of words. But the end stick is basically, I see the staked pole on the ground from which something made sense. The end stick is more than just digital signatures, it's actually starting to build a government level framework. But it's not, in a way, politically driven. See, that's the other beauty about security, isn't it? I don't have to care in some ways. Okay, yes, I do. But if you think about it, security will happen anyway. Cybersecurity continues whether or not it's a man, a woman, or a furry beast from Alpha Centauri in some kind of shaped office. It's going to happen. It's got to keep moving. And if you think about an identity ecosystem like the end stick, it is born out of an understanding that things happen and need to grow and don't change overnight. And realizing that the actual origins of this came from a 2009 cybersecurity policy review. And there's probably an earlier one than that, but that was the original one that I stumbled across that made me realize that they knew this sucked. They were aware at the time that after, what do you think that the congressmen are sitting there, and the congresswomen, I mean, well, okay, it turns out that we've been owned. I don't think they get that. They didn't see that. In 2009, or 2008, when the legwork was being done, the only thing I think folks who aren't involved in this industry probably think is that it means the end of the world as they know it. And it's just gonna keep getting worse until eventually rainbows shoot out both ends and then it's just the game's over. And, and so, okay, so something clicked along the path of this thinking which made me realize, okay, so RFCs lead to uh, uh, actual standards. Standards become things people like to tick check boxes on which lead to actual policies getting uh, developed which eventually leads to implementation. That's the concept. But how do you do that at such a high level that it would impact all the rest of us? All of us. And this is nothing new. The answer is, well, here, here it is. Here's a smart card. You've seen them before. They were in satellite boxes in, what, the 80s? People used to actually sell them on the black market and they would trade them so they could get free movies. And eventually there is actually a kill signal that they could have sent over the open airwaves to fry the smart cards. And companies did it. But then we came up with, well, not we, but what was released, the one that was most popular at the time from my point of view was the American Express Blue Card, one of the earliest smart cards I ever saw and actually ordered because it came with this cool reader. I said, oh my gosh, I can plug it into my computer and I can, what? Um, anybody ever have one of those cards? Anyone else? No, crickets, cool. Wait, one, one person, thank you for at least responding. I'm glad you're still awake. Uh, so no, the, 
the fact is, is that there was really nothing to do with that card. It didn't really have any implementation, and so we actually failed. We failed miserably at the original implementation of smart card technology in this country, leading to that first super memorable talk for me at ShmooCon, where a person said, by the way, other countries have been doing this successfully for five, six, seven years. It was 2011, and I'm listening, or 2012, excuse me, and we failed to understand and to implement this thing because we're scared, because it's hard, and that's the problem that we didn't make it easy enough. So time for return of the thing. The smart card tech, which we all knew and loved or hated and despised or didn't care about and were ambivalent regarding, is coming back and it's a core piece of the NSTIC ecosystem. And then EMV cards, which by the way, EMV, EuroCard, you know, EuroPay, MasterCard, and Visa, it is a smart card technology. Why don't we have PIN? on that technology in this country? Why is there no interface for that? Everyone had to upgrade their rigs to take the thing anyway. Well, because we're leading towards, I think, the obvious, a national smart card. We're gonna get there in this country. And that's right back to the uh, unicorn rainbows shooting out both ends. So if we actually have this giant smart card and you can see that this picture is old, it's from 2007, and we haven't gotten there yet because it turns out we keep messing it up. And I think we're gonna actually have to deal with the fact that we don't make something as easy as this. If you've ever seen one of these, it's the Jitterbug flip phone smartphone, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, I am proud to say that, you know what, for all the complaints I've ever heard from supporting folks who have phones with tiny buttons, they actually like this. It's easy. I flip open the phone, I can see there are buttons, I can dial, it's a phone. It doesn't happen to order pizza and try to walk my dog. So we unfortunately seem to keep putting smart cards in the bin of super special mousetrap technology. And the problem is we keep expecting to get smarter mice and instead it's really not gonna work out that way. <laughs> We're all gonna just have very, very confused grandparents who keep calling us to ask them to help how to set this thing up and make use of it. So bottom line, it is really all about trust and it's about establishing and making this so easy that we can actually use it the same way we consider it's easy using one of these. If I can't pick up a device and touch this to it and make it work in under three seconds, it's gone. It's not gonna fly. And I tried to come up with something, I bet all, how many of you are in here who have ever tried to be part of a startup company that did something really unique? Something you thought was kind of awesome that you wanted to actually work with and use? Just me, no, just kidding, no. So I had this brilliant on paper idea. I wanted to get out there and I said, I'm going to describe it like this. And in the real world, a friend reminded me, no, you can't change the way this functions. There are already functions in place to do these things. Yes, but that's why we need something new. And the answer is wrong, fail. <laughs> People do not want something new. They want something easier that makes it more secure that costs nothing. So in the face of things like having lots of unknowns, because really NSTIC is a piece of policy at a very high level. It connects the dots between request for comment documentation, a bunch of standards, a lot of concepts and ideas that will eventually fold out into these meeting groups like the steering committee, the identity, uh, uh, the ID ecosystem steering group, right? So, right, you've got this giant layer, almost imagine it like, have you ever saw the movie Tron? No one there is older than me, no, Tron. All right. So the cloud layer in Tron, the concept that you've got top down, it's not that hard to imagine. And if you, at the very top level of the 10,000 or 100,000 foot view, you have these committees that wanna help implement these things. And let's imagine the further down we get into the weeds, we have the people who actually know how to make it work and write all the very fancy documentation or very hard, fought documentation that becomes the standards. We are in grave danger of needing another 20 years to make this happen, but there's a thing that'll flip on its head if we're not careful. Because in history, as we've been demonstrated, you either are part of a group to do something special, and then it can flip on its head, and you can't be part of that group to do something special. It's opt-in at the beginning, and you're not allowed to opt-out at the end. 
If this doesn't make sense, what I'm talking about is the concept that today you can, let's say you have to touch in some way a government organization in your job. Someone at your job, someone at your workplace has to interface with a governing body. And to do this, they have to probably log into a website, which means they have to create an account, which is another password, which may or may not be secure, which may or may not lead to them having to take specialized training whether or not they have the gear to do it. And they have to. They're required. And today, it's done with that password, user ID password. But tomorrow, when eventually we get to, and I'm saying it's going to be, I wanted to see it within the next five years. I wanted to see a national electronic smart card that would replace, for example, a driver's license. It would be issued locally, but connected federally, which that would require a lot of people to choke on a lot of rainbows and unicorns to get to happen. Because the system resists change, people are allergic to it. They break out in hives, or at least elections. And the problem is, is we're not going to change because we fear change. We want the future, but we don't want to pay the price. The answer is establishing trust in an electronic smart card and building the future for ourselves, but no one is going to hand it to us, and it's up to us to start making the change and being the change. But I'm not saying anything you're probably not already aware of. The problem is, is that we're not paying attention to it. We deal with the distractions of the week. If you know about a show called No Agenda Show, right? they talk about a lot of high vaunted theories and ideas. It's usually pretty uh, tinfoil hatty. I know I have Faraday cage underoos myself. No, there are no pictures. The, the point is, and I'm sparing you, that's actually meant to save space for you right there. The, the point is, is that we actually have to begin to engage with our own regulatory bodies to ask for this to be done if we truly want something that can get better. And if we don't, that's understandable, that's fine. We'll stick our heads back in the sand and complain that we don't have the hoverboard we always wanted. Until such time, the world is open and asking, calling for papers, looking for the next submission that'll bring us one step closer because we need to learn how to do that. And I don't think we understand enough yet because it isn't easy enough yet, because even though the technology works tremendously well, we know that it takes a, an armada of PlayStation computers networked together to break 1024 crypto, but you can do it. And Quantum makes it, oh, look, now it'll be on the head of a pin. Whatever size it is, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you can fly well, using a Commodore 64 to the moon. The bottom line is, if it isn't easy enough to use, it might as well be as useful as flying to the moon. Because most of us, if given the opportunity, have no reason to go there. So where do we want to go? And that answer remains to be seen. There, that was fast. Much faster than originally timed. Anybody have any uh, rants, questions, comments, things you'd like to throw at me? If not, seriously, I am Sciatic Nerd, AKA Steven Bernstein, and I thank you very much for your time.